Since the dawn of civilization, man has been trying to overcome odds with the resources at their disposal to make his life safe and comfortable. Jute has helped humans in a myriad of ways. Jute, as most of us know, is an inexpensive fiber. It is scientifically named as Corcoris. This is one of the most important bast fibers and comes second in production to only cotton among all the natural fibers. The fiber is obtained from the stem of two cultivated species of Corcoris. This video will be about history and origin of jute, jute use in India, its production, morphology of its plant, the two main types of jute, that is Corcoris capsularis and Corcoris olitorius, fiber morphology, its processing, and finally jute fiber to yarn. Historically speaking, the jute plant is mentioned as food in the Bible as well as in ancient Egyptian and other early Mediterranean literature, but its use as a fiber is somewhat obscure. The generic name Corcoros is believed to have been derived from the words Corcoros used by the Greeks for the pot herb. Talking about the center of origins, the origin of Corcoros capsularis is thought to be the Indo-Burma region and the origin of Corcoros olitorius is thought to be Africa. The genus Corcoros consists of about 40 species, of which 36 have been recorded in Africa. Jute is a very old agricultural produce, cultivated mostly in the Ganga Brahmaputra Delta in the Indian subcontinent. Its leaves were consumed as vegetable and used as a household herbal remedy. It was, however, after setting up of jute mills in the vicinity of Kolkata in the mid-19th century that its cultivation gained importance and was systematized. But before that, only in the last decade of the 18th century, the British East India Company first sensed the potential of jute fiber and sent samples of jute plant, then called Indian grass, to England. Three decades later, jute fiber was sent to Scotland, the global textile hub at that time, for tests and its uniqueness was established after the tests. Experiments at Scotland revealed high initial strength of jute fiber and their improved spinability by admixture of a softening oil. By around 1870, jute sack turned to be the most sought after flexible packaging container due to its low price and good quality and led to setting up of a large number of jute mills in the eastern part of the Indian subcontinent. India and Bangladesh are the highest producers of jute, according to FAO report of 2016. Indian states that majorly contribute to jute production are mainly the state of West Bengal, Bihar, Assam and Andhra Pradesh. Jute is also grown in Meghalaya, Uttar Pradesh, Maharashtra and Tripura. Jute plant has an erect stalk with leaves. It thrives in hot and humid climate, especially in areas where rainfall is copious. It grows up to about 3 meters in height usually and matures within 4 to 6 months. The two species, that is, Corcoros olitorius and Corcoros capsularis are common in many ways. Both the cultivated species are woody, little branched annuals having simple ovate serrate margin leaves with peculiar curved bristles called auricles at the base of the leaves. Flowers are solitary or arranged in floral cymes. Corcoros capsularis, also called as white jute, is a tall, little branched annual which can go up to 3 to 3.7 meters tall with ovate glabrous leaves containing a bitter glycoside called corcorin making the leaf bitter. It is a lowland species that can withstand water logging. Peculiar shape of leaf base auricles can be found in both the species that is olitorius and capsularis. 
Small yellow flowers give rise to wrinkled capsules enclosing brown seeds. These fruits are of capsular species. The characteristics of C. olitorius, also called as tossa jute, are that the plant is much taller, flowers are larger in size, capsules are long, cylindrical, ridged, with an elongated beak. The leaf lacks corcorin and therefore the leaf, the leaf is sweet. It is an upland species. This table here compares the fibre of the two species. The fibre of Capsularis is normally whitish and is sold at a lower price, whereas the fibre of Olutorius is finer, softer, stronger and more lustrous and hence is highly priced. The colour could vary from grey, yellow, red, depending on the retting water it has been soaked in. Harvesting. The plants are harvested when around 50% of the plants are in fruiting stage. At this stage, the quality and the yield is good. Early harvesting yields in white fibres, but the yields are poor and the fibres are weak. Late harvesting increases the yield and produces coarse, that is, stronger fibres. Plants are cut close to the ground with the help of a sickle or pulled out by hand when it is growing underwater. In flooded areas, like Assam and Bangladesh, where the flood water rises pretty high, the harvesters often dive to cut the stem. The cut stems are tied in small bundles and are left in the fields for two to three days for the leaves to wilt and drop off, a process of defoliation. After harvesting and defoliation of plants in the fields for three to four days, the jute stems are retted in water and the fiber is extracted. The traditional method is to ret the jute stems for about 15 to 18 days and extract the fiber manually after retting. During retting, bacteria break down the soft tissues around the fiber bundles and the fibers. Retting is complete when the bark separates out easily from the core. The end point of retting is a critical stage that largely determines the quality of the fiber. It is difficult to extract the fiber if the plants are taken from the water too early. On the other hand, the fibre is weakened if retting is continued for too long. Before extraction, the farmers make frequent checks to determine the end point of retting. Correct retting is essentially the first step in the production of good quality fibre. Conventionally, all the operations of retting followed by extraction of the fibres are done manually to date. Jute fibre, unlike cotton, is a multicellular fibre. In the jute plant, the fibre is formed as a cylindrical sheath made up of single fibers called ultimate cells that are joined together in such a way as to form a 3D network from top to bottom of the stem. The commercial fibers in the form of fiber bundles of 1.5 to 3 meter long called reed are held together as a unit by the meshy or network structure of the fiber elements and represents only a very small proportion that is 4 to 6 percent of the whole plant. Each fibre element of these meshes of a raw jute reed is basically a group of ultimate cells, cemented together laterally and longitudinally by means of intercellular materials. A single fibre of jute thus comprises a bundle of ultimates and hence is a multicellular fibre. The ultimate cells are spindle shaped and of variable size in length and width. The cross section of jute stem shows flowing wedges that lie outside of the xylem. In the flowing wedges lie these bast fibers. The blue colored polygonal cells with rounded corners are the bast fibers. Jute contains 56 to 63 percent cellulose, 22 to 26 percent hemicellulose, 11 to 12 percent lignin that makes it less durable and other components like fats, waxes, gums and mineral in very small quantities. Extraction is done after retting. Plants are taken out of water and the fiber is traditionally extracted by hand. Extraction is done manually followed by washing and drying to make the fiber suitable for commercial use.
The washing process consists of holding the extracted fibre bundle by the butt end and jerking it through the water. Clean water is used for washing. The entire dirt, gum, extra plant materials and retting residues are removed thoroughly. The washed fibre is spread over a bamboo perch or bar for thorough sun drying for 4-7 to seven days before storage. Drying on bare ground is discouraged because it affects quality of fibre by contamination with various dust particles, sand, etc. The journey of jute fibre to yarn is done in a number of steps. The first is opening, cleaning and mixing. The entangled raw jute fibers are to be denoted and freed from impurities by cleaning. Usually, mixing of different qualities of fibers is done for commercial as well as technical reasons. This is known as carding. The next step is formation of slivers. Slivers are produced during carding operation. After disentanglement of jute fibers by carding, each jute strand is cleaned again. Carded slivers are usually thick and contain a large number of fibers. And hence the next step, thinning of slivers. Thinning of slivers is essentially an operation of pressing through a pair of feed and a pair of delivery roller. But the process causes longitudinal and irregularity of slivers. A process known as doubling in which slivers are mixed in appropriate proportions help overcome this irregularity. The last step is parallelization of fibers. Making fibers parallel to each other in sliver is a prerequisite for twist insertion in the next stage. A good degree of parallelization ensures good strength. And that is exactly how jute completes its journey from the fields to the mills. Most of the jute is manufactured into sacks and bags. It also is used in the making of rugs, carpets, oilcloth, twine, upholstery, curtains and coarse cloth. Jute stem buds are used in the manufacture of paper and paperboard. The young shoots are an important vegetable in various parts of Africa, Sudan and Greece. Jute industry, perhaps the oldest surviving agro-industry in the world, on which more than 4 million people depend directly and indirectly in India, has thrived on this particular product alone. With intrusion of man-made fiber that is more durable and long-lasting, the monopoly of jute sacks has been on the wane and jute industry has been desperately on, on the lookout for new avenues for survival. The man-made fiber could be long-lasting, but it's definitely not good for the environment.